This podcast is supported by Secretly Society, a record club offering the best new albums in exclusive limited edition vinyl colours delivered to your door each month with perks like free shipping, members only discounts and first dibs on rare finds. Secretly Society is a record club for new collectors and crate diggers alike. Sign up and become a member wherever you are in the world. Just head on over to secretlystore.com. Welcome back to Secretly Frequencies, the podcast that meets record labels and artists from the Secretly Group family and hears untold stories behind their musical histories. We're almost at the end of this new season, but not before we go back to where it all began with one of our earliest co-hosts, and longtime friend of Secretly, and perhaps most importantly, a huge fan of today's musical guests, Manish Agarwal. Hi, Manish. Hey, Tom. Excited to be back. Not least because today we're speaking to Kid Millions and Bobby Matador of Oneida. So I would usually give a little potted history and description of the band at this point in the episode. But the idea of giving a quick overview of an Ida seems almost impossible and likely a fruitless task. What can I say? They started in 1997 in New York and are one of the most singular bands of the last 30 years. To describe Oneida's music using adjectives or nouns is only going to make me look like a grade A fool, so I'm just going to encourage you to listen to this episode and hear it for yourself. I will say that you will hear a slight change in audio as you listen to this episode because we had to record it in two parts. Manish, have you ever managed to nail a description of Anida? Not really. I'd say they were uh, semi-professional entertainers from Brooklyn, New York, (laughs) mainly working in the idioms of rock and roll. But I think they can describe it better themselves. Okay, let's hear from the band themselves. Hi, kid. Hi, Bobby. Are you there? Hey, yep, we're here. Thanks for having us. This is Bobby talking. Yeah, right here. This is Kid. How you doing? Awesome. Well, without further ado, should we go ahead and hear our first song? Are you ready? Do you think you're going to get on okay with this? (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) Uh, No idea. Well, we know this one. Let's turn it up loud. That's from our uh, second full-length album, Enemy Hogs, maybe 1999. Yeah. We've gone back just about a quarter century there. Right on. (laughs) Um, We sound so much younger. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, that was Turn It Up Loud, originally released on Turnbuckle in 1999 and then reissued by Jag Jaguar in 2001. So... Let's go back to the late 90s. How did you all meet? Kid and I met long before the late 90s. We met in the late 80s. We went to high school together and played in bands starting probably 1990. But then, yeah, late 90s, we ended up moving to New York. I'll bet you 89. We probably touched on a few yeah. things. Yeah, don't you? possibly. Playing Maybe. a Grateful Dead anyway, cover band. We're an 80s Yeah, yeah band. a Grateful Dead cover <laughs> band at our high school that had a bunch of seniors in it, wanted some extra uh, musicians, and they uh, they tapped Kid and me, and we ended up supplying. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, we moved to New York together from our respective. We kept in touch and played music together, and we're both in bands through college, and we each played in a band with Jane during college, who went to school with Kid and then took some time and came out to Ohio where I was, and... I was playing bass in a band and determined that we could probably use another bass player. So we both played bass in the same band, then moved to New York. And then Kid, how did you hook up with with Crazy? I ran into Crazy at a party in the East Village, actually. I don't know why we ended up there. I think it was 
being put on by somebody in tech. I mean, back then it would have been like websites, kind of extravagant party, and we just ran into each other in that drunken haze. It was kind of like, oh, wow, we should we should do an album together. Like, let's do it. Instead of like just saying it, we actually did it. So it's Oberlin College. Is that correct? I attended a small college uh, outside Cleveland, Ohio called Oberlin College. But the rest of those guys were were New England based. <laughs> yeah, we went to Middlebury, which is in Vermont. Crazy and I started the band, but it was like not named Oneida. It was just uh, us two working on an album with, on a four track, slowly chipping away at it. And then Papa Crazy and I were like making this thing. And occasionally, like, I think, you know, we had Bobby come in on a couple of jams and I'm sure Jane ended up on it too. Once we had somehow hoodwinked someone into releasing demo, it. <laughs> yeah, that got, yeah, the demo got released and then we decided to tour because the label, they gave us money to tour and it was all based on how much time you spent on the road. So we were like, all right, let's just go out for a long time. And so then we needed a band and then we brought in Bobby and Jane. And by the time we finished that tour, it was like, well, these guys are maybe more talented than we are. <laughs> it shouldn't just be our band. That's the, the band that made Enemy Hogs, where, the, you know, from the song that you just played for us. Yeah, that song, Turn It Up Loud, was almost a project in, I won't say depravity crazy wrote the song he wrote the riff and the and the words and we we're like what can we do to make this song feel uncomfortable maybe is a better word discomfort <laughs> is the right word and so as yeah. one does one immediately thinks boys choir and we <laughs> happened to be lucky yeah. enough to have access to the grace church boys choir through some connections and one of us, so. which was me, had to figure out how to notate the melody. We all have certain areas in which we're kind of trained as musicians, but we're not like readers of music. So I figured out how do you write down this melody, and then Kid and Crazy took it to the recording session with the... Uh, I don't think with, Crazy was No, it was there. just you? I thought someone... It was me and Ramsey. Oh, oh, okay, you and a friend, yeah. And it was like the guy who was directing and, and, the choir had a hard time translating what I had written, which, by the way, I have gone back over and it was absolutely correct for the record. After we had an hour, and this happened at 6 a.m., because that's when the boys' choir rehearsed, we <laughs> rolled up with a, z I mean, we had a like a DAT recorder. The director introduced us and they were like, okay, boys, this is what you're going to do today. We had the DAT recorder set up. <laughs> It was super <laughs> fucked. It was really in bad. It was a bad situation because they weren't doing it right. I was freaking <laughs> out because I was like, how is this going to work? I mean, we only had, it was under an hour and you know, that yeah, goes yeah. quick. At the end of it, we did have some recordings, but I was like devastated. I was like this, we're fucked. The amazing story is we, we went to the master. Yeah. Like the record was session. done. The record was mixed. Yeah. Is and we attended the mastering. <laughs> yeah, and I think we brought the DAT just because, I mean, part of it was maybe even the DAT wasn't playing. But anyway, I brought the DAT and we were like, hey, man, to Alan Douches, to be fair, this was, the, you know. And we were like, okay, so we really wanted to have us boys choir on this song. And they don't sing in the right rhythm. It's off. And he was like, Oh really? He's like, well, let me, let me see, let me see, P put it in, and and he's like, I think I can fix yeah. it. I mean, Alan's a wizard. Oh, it worked out. And not only yeah, that, it but worked out. at that point, once we were like, wow, you mean like we can add things in mastering? We were like, well, the song really it should end with a gong hit. <laughs> Do you have any gongs in a mastering studio? And he's like, no, guys, yeah, I he... don't have any gongs, but I could probably find a digital sample of a gong somewhere. And he went into whatever platform he was using this so this is 1998 or early 99 and he's like oh look i have three gong samples so being oneida we were like well just let's put all three gong samples on the end of the song in mastering so that's how the song ends 
let's queue up the next track. Hey, we know that one too. <laughs> yes. We yeah, that's all rounder that one. From, from Anthem of the Moon. We know that one. In fact, we still play that one from time to time live. Yeah, it's it's a, still in the mix. A, remains a ripper. That song was All Around Her from 2001's Anthem of the Moon. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like being in a band in Brooklyn in 2001 when you made that record? <laughs> tell us about the loft scene. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean well so we came into being a band and making music in the 90s in the late 90s at a time when the dominant narrative in new york was rock and roll and bands are a thing of the past electronic music is a thing of the future and there's enough distance on that now that it seems like well that's just part of the natural progressions right but so we felt, even though we had the ability to play shows at some of the great small rock clubs that were kicking around at that time, like Brownies and the Knitting Factory, we also just started to set our sights in a lot of empty available spaces that were in Brooklyn where we were living and playing. And we were playing, I mean, the first record was recorded by Kid and Crazy in, in our space which was an abandoned nightclub like an empty nightclub that had been closed down we met some like-minded souls and artists and people who had these big spaces and just felt like we can do interesting things in interesting ways in you know the loading dock of a space that we were trying to build a studio in the heavy cultural authority uh, an iron foundry that our friend Fitz located and put a show on in i'm trying to think of these early spaces you know just sort of industrial brooklyn spaces there were just tons of them you know there were other people doing similar things at that time maybe here and there and the specific memory that comes to me because if you know if you're living in new york and you think 2001 like 9 11 is not far from your mind and i recall we had a tour planned that started in september but the first show was at the mighty robot loft space on south side williamsburg south fifth the old like upstairs mighty robot and it was us and plastic uh, crime uh, wave uh, but the japanese group plastic acid crime mother's wave and temple. yeah and um and acid mother's yeah. temple it was like i mean you could probably look this up i don't know what was it like september 17th yeah. something 2001 yeah. i'm sure it's out there it was like within a week or so of within the, five you know, it was or still, six everything days, was still closed downtown it was like within five or six yeah. days and we played this show and it was just packed out like to the gills in this tiny super dangerous upstairs warehouse space i just remember being transported by being there by playing there and by like the, the acid mother's set and like feeling like at the edge of something really really cool and powerful so that's like my if you say 2001 lost space i remember that show and then we headed out for a 35 day tour we got home and I do actually remember the final show was back in New York and was on a, a light ship docked over on the West Side Pier. It's called the Frying Pan and like Array Serata and Yeah Yeah Yeahs and us and some other bands played at that show. And that's like the bookends to this like extremely like what could have been a really dislocating, alienating moment to be in that world and in that space. And it just felt like really, really a potent experience of like, wow, music and this musical community is extremely real and just moved me. And I felt, I felt caught up in it and swept up in it in a way that, um, you know, hasn't left me. That's awesome. Okay. We're going to move on to the next track now. Let's give it a spin. See if you can figure out what it is.
speaking of golems. Caesar's column. <laughs> Caesar's column. Yeah, Caesar's column <laughs> from uh, Secret Wars. Early 2004. January 2004. You were label mates with the Strokes over here for this record. It came out on That's a rough right. trade. Didn't it? <laughs> that song's amazing. Kid could talk about the genesis of it. That's him singing. He wrote the lyrics and put the beat together. All the drumming I developed was just through the band, just playing. Because you'd have to come up with different things, different ways of working together. And it was the first record without Crazy, we should say, because Crazy quit. We had to start from scratch kind of as a trio, which took a lot of, of work. I mean, of course, everything went real fast. Back then, it seemed forever. I think we, we didn't play <laughs> a show in four months, and we were like, oh, my God. We've, yeah, it's yeah, over, man. Like, and, and then we, <laughs> you know, when we redid it, when we played as a trio, it seemed to work. We were still figuring it out. Definitely forced us to consider space. Yeah, because there was a lot of space music, all of a like sudden. Like sonic space. <laughs> and then instead, at first, we were sort of like, we got to fill the space. And then it was like, or we could step back from that and actually fill even less space. At least that's where my head went. I, I do think we hear it in Caesar's column, which it should be noted is not the recording of a trio because our friend K-Rock, who had spent time in Bali learning to play Balinese gamelan, shipped back a whole collection of massive Balinese gongs. Just huge, huge gongs, which are part of that recording. He played them on the recording and they're, they're big kind of bell-shaped gongs that emit these very slow developing low frequency tones along with the sort of stacked harmonics that that come with any kind of like large scale metal <laughs> instrument but recording those gongs and getting them to feel like they really fill the recording of the song was pretty challenging and then we went on tour and he came on tour with us and he'd built he built gongs. all these big yeah and he'd built these big wooden frames that were disassemblable but the gongs would take like two people to carry each one. And he had, I don't know, three, <laughs> four with him. Like you live this, what seems to me to be like a hellish life, right? Where like band after band, four bands a night, every night of your life come in and are like, my guitar has to sound like this. And here come these clowns piling out of this big <laughs> dented conversion van bringing gong after gong and be like yeah i think you can mic these with like 57s and you know just try and get him into the mix <laughs> i look at that tour for a lot of reasons with great affection but one of one of the things is like you know we have a pretty good track record that we can look back on now and be like oh we've had a lot of ideas that were impractical or caused us to expend a lot more energy than maybe would have been wise or efficient or would have led directly to some sort of success. We've like derailed ourselves in a lot of ways. And the gong tour is a great example of that. Like it made that tour so much more challenging, but so much cooler. Secret Wars turns 20 next year. So hopefully it will uh, get a issue and we can, the remix is a, that remix 12 inches long out print. Yeah, that's right. Maybe a nice, a nice double LP vinyl <laughs> reissue with the remixes. I think we should go to the next track, Tom. What do you think? Doing business in Japan. <laughs> that was Doing Business in Japan from 2000's Come On Everybody, Let's Rock. Uh, we're going to have to give Patrick Sullivan, Papa Crazy, like deep, deep, deep plaudits for writing one hell of a classic rock yeah, anthem yeah, yeah. there. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's his genius at work, that song. So that's on the Come On Everybody, Let's Rock album. That album was a homework project. Each of the four of us had to write a song and bring it into the band. 
and with the understanding that the the EP would be called Come On Everybody Let's Rock. And then we had we had a couple other things floating around that we were like working on and pushing forward, but that was Crazy's contribution. That was <laughs> the homework assignment that he completed and came in with. So it was t- title first, music yes. later on that one. But we should okay. be clear though, there's a story behind this because <laughs> this was the first full length on Jag Jaguar for us. Mm-hmm. And like they had they kind of punted the EP that we put out before. This is like Steel Rod. That was the first release we did with them with Jag Jaguar and they were like something happened they're like yeah the distribution wasn't quite set up so that EP is not going to be around at many stores like don't you know we'll get it next time. And we were like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and we were like, well, we have this second EP. They were like, I don't know. So they're like, EPs. So EPs, we pay the band 500 bucks to mix it and record it. If you want to do a full length, we'll give you 1200 I think was the figure. And it was like, we were like, well, fuck. I guess we're going to make this a, a full length. You know, there's actually a very, very lengthy hidden track on the EP, on the Steel Rod EP that preceded Come On Everybody Let's Rock, which had we not insisted that that be a hidden track that only plays when you like, I can't remember if it's like you let it keep playing or if you have to go negative one. I think one you have to go CD negative player. or something stupid. Do you have to go negative one? Maybe, I don't something, know. Something yeah, classic. That is dumb. a classic 90s CD yes, release. Yes, <laughs> totally. And I'm confident that if we had just like been like, and then there's this 11 minute track, like we probably actually had a full length album. <laughs> <laughs> We should uh, we should move on to the next track. You've got to look into the Still in play. Sheets of Easter, of course. Of yeah. course. That absolute classic was Sheets of Easter from Each One Teach One, released on Jag Jaguar in 2002. That was definitely a, a major, major turning point or moment for us. It was like, uh, I remember when we first played it, how perverse it felt and exciting. And I think it kind of took us... We were able to get there because I feel like we, I even think even back when we made those other records, we were still like slightly calculating, not in a major way, but we were kind of like, this is still within the realm of we're making songs, we're a band, we're trying to get people to like us. But I think we just reached a point where (laughs) we were just like, well, this is a this seems wild. Like, why would a band do this? Like, but we're going to do it. We're going to open the set with it. <laughs> we're going to just. Yeah. Always the first, first tour. That was the set opener every oh, night. Oh yeah. And we just like, we didn't care anymore. We knew it was really awesome and powerful, but yeah. I think that song has become, you, you mentioned like, I've seen people dance to it, pogo to it. I just go into like a trance state when you play it. It's quite meditative. This is the song that got you into the onion. (laughs) uh, High point, high point for the band right there. uh, Encourage, encourage the listener to, uh, to Google, uh, the onion Oneida sheets of Easter, see what we're talking about. Yeah. There's not many bands. Had a news story devoted to them. uh, America's foremost news source. Yeah. You know, I've never had more people reach out like from outside of our our music world reach out and be like yo i saw you in fill in the blank it was the onion by far it was never like saw that article in the times amazing you know or like or like great feature in whatever music publication no it's the onion well actually i do wanted to ask a little bit more about what your reaction has been to press over the years you have been on the receiving end of some of the most glowing reviews i've ever read and i'll be honest 
some of the meanest <laughs> ones I've ever read as well. Is it something that you care about at all? Are there any particular highlights that you have, both good or bad? I I tend to read it. I'm in, just interested if it seems like people have listened to the music. That's all. Even if they don't like it, if it's like quickly dismissive or even quickly effusive, it's just not interesting to me. I mean, really positive press I look at, I'm like, Great! This is a good thing for our band. That's great. Right? It's <laughs> not know, often. I'm not that like really fuck this. Nobody understands us. I don't right, care. Right, right. Like no, that's yeah. great. You know, please write a write a smashingly effusive review. But I I don't care about it unless it's like somebody who has listened to the music and has has some sort of take on it and a relationship with it. it. Doesn't have to be something that I feel or agree with. And I remember experiencing that with in interviews. Sometimes you sit down and people will ask you about the music and you're like, well what's your take on it like what do you think where do you put it and it's not like a it's not like a litmus test you know it's not like you have to get this right and you have to hear references it's more just like do you want to spend time with this or are you punching the clock and if you're punching the clock let's just do this and you know put it on the cover of your magazine please thank you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when we did i mean in terms of press that was really life changing we we got put on the cover of Blow Up, which is an Italian music magazine, when when Each One Teach One came out. And it just changed just the life of the band at that point. We were able to go to Italy. We were able to go to Europe. It was a, We were able to kind of connect with a new audience. That really had an impact. Yep, yeah, let's hear the next song. German girl, the Iger is a whole wide world. Watch the climbers from our bed, we know that they may end up dead. I don't want to die among the snow and ice, while frozen singing anal vice without my flask of wine and conversation. Find it no warm bed at night with flowers in your hair and waltzes floating in the air and babies crying in the chairs and running through the garden fair like lovers we never were. The Iger from the wedding. Uh, that song was called The Iger from 2005's The Wedding. Lots of questions about this period, like possibly an Ida's prettiest, most fragrant album. <laughs> fragrant. Um, wait, wait, wait. I think you're, you're going to have to define your terms carefully because, you know, all of Rated O, which came later, was made shirtless. <laughs> no shirts were used in the entire recording of that record. So fragrant, I don't think you can give. Perfumed. It's a, it's a really... Perfumed. Perfumed. It's, it's a, it's a perfume. <laughs> it's a really beautiful record um you know that it has true. that august morning haze and heavenly choirs and lavender it smells like lavender uh, but there's lots of mythology around this record so i want to start with um one of the claims is it true that you built the largest music box on the east coast of the united states it is yes yes absolutely <laughs> um all right, look, for the benefit of, of listeners, both of you, here's the deal. This record, which was released, I think, in two, I'm going to say 2006, 2005, maybe. Um, yeah, Five. 2005. Yeah. Um, at this time, and I can't say things have changed that much, Oneida had a complicated skeptical relationship with what we would look at as, you know, the music press as a monolithic concept, which obviously nothing like that is a monolithic concept. But it had occurred to us and been shown to us that there were a lot of highly credulous people working ostensibly as music journalists. And we enjoyed sort of creating, I guess, what, what now might be called um, directing the narrative of how an album was made. So we just happened to do the narrative in reverse. We made the music and... We then considered, well, how could music like this have been made? And the obvious answer for the wedding, our studio was on the waterfront in Brooklyn and on the Williamsburg waterfront, the industrial waterfront at the time. 
And it was our studio, our studio space. And it was clear to us that what we had done was we had salvaged all kinds of marine flotsam and jetsam that had come across through the, the East River. And using these massive pieces of wood and metal, we had built a music box, an amateurish, gigantic, world-sized music box there on the banks of the East River using this marine detritus and the tones that that box produced, we were simply the antennae, if you will, taking those reverberations and composing an album from them. Yes, that story did come to us after we had recorded the album, but it was subsequently clear that that must have been what we did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, this is no different from, you know, your Jack Jaguar label mate, Bonifer, recording in a cabin in the woods, you know? Yeah, but he, he managed to sell a lot of records that yeah, way. That was the, the only <laughs> the difference. One, the one crucial difference. <laughs> Such a fine line. It's Such a fine it's a line. It's a fine line I between, believe, between stupid and clever, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say I will say I was shocked when, when I got into a conversation with Dan Friel from Parts and Labor at the time. And he was like, it's so awesome that you guys built this music box. It's so amazing. And I was just like, dude, what? We didn't do that. Like, and, and he was like, so upset. He was, he was, <laughs> he was shattered. And I, I, in the moment I was like, wow, I'm sorry. Like, damn. I yeah. Take that. Just a reminder that you can say things and if they're printed, people assume that they're real. It's like, I, I do have to say, maybe we can look at ourselves as calling out something that actually has greater meaning. That, that I think is how, in a more sincere way, we'd look at that, right? You direct how people receive information and startlingly, <laughs> they'll receive it without interrogating it. <laughs> well, I think we should move on to the next, the next song. <laughs> I can hear all the hexolalia. I love that song. I don't remember what title we gave it, though. <laughs> what, okay, yeah. Oh, is it from Secret Wars? No, it's from um, no, it's from right? uh, Happy New Year. That's busy, busy little, little bee. bee. That's right. Yeah. Had we gotten to the uh, had we gotten to the chorus, I would have t I would have told you that. <laughs> I love that song. I love the folk instrument stuff on that record. That came out of so the record Happy New Year actually, which followed the wedding. A lot of that music came out of our first attempt at putting together the Thank Your Parents series that ultimately came later. It was sort of like we knew we had an idea of what we wanted to do, and then we took several stabs at it and got caught, I think, in a really cool place. It didn't end up producing this like three-part series that we thought. That's something we started again later. What the record Happy New Year has is this really cool mixture between kind of more electronic derived stuff that we were coming up with, which could include Up With People, which started as Kid and me listening to, I think, like, I don't know, Chicago House stuff and trying to trying to steal concepts from that. And then a few other pieces and then a whole bunch of folk related stuff. And you hear that in some of the instrumentation there. And in some of the songwriting, and actually the first song on the record, Distress, is an old shape note folk hymn that we didn't write. I feel like that record gets a little bit lost in our discography, in part because it's like the Zeppelin Three record. Right? Yeah. When we sent that record to the label, they were like, you know, guys, this is cool, but maybe you should think about like, doing fewer albums and like, you know, don't, 
don't be in such a rush. And, and it was like, okay, cool. <laughs> like that was like the vibe. Cool. I mean, you know about a triple record. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a real shame in a way because I think this is like a great introductory record to the band. It has such a, a wide spectrum of songs. That's what NPR said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There are certain certain songs that connect us to our past but still feel very much like who Oneida is at the moment. And that's a you know, that's one yeah. that people seem to have connected with over whatever it's been 15, 16 years, 17 years since that record came out. I've DJed that song. It's like it's yeah. a great dance track. Yeah. I, um would I be right in thinking that this is the start of Shaheen and Barry working with Well, so we've been working with him for a number of years. He did a piece of Secret Wars, didn't he? He may he may have mixed some of the Secret Wars. I also know that we were working with him doing some compilation tracks here and there. But where Barry and Shaheen, well, where Barry comes into the picture as a like touring member of Oneida, as well as like a guy we worked a ton with recording is right around this time. And actually, when we toured the US at the time of the Happy New Year album, we toured with Barry. I think he was, yeah, Barry was running sound. And we also had another guitarist. We had uh, Phil Manley from Trans Am was part of touring on that whole record. And then Shaheen joined us on that tour that is the moment when this all started to like coalesce i was playing i mean around this time i was playing in x models we made an album and i did a few tours one was in england did you come i did yeah. i remember <laughs> i remember that show well actually tom not tom's finest moment um <laughs> was it the buffalo um, bar it Time was... to reframe some of the <laughs> some of the story here. It was no, uh, I... was this the show at the Buffalo Bar when it was really X models were like the post punk hype of the week in that kind of post lies yeah yeah yes that would have been about two thousand three yeah and it was with yeah, the, the... the the band that the No Age guys um, were in at the time or was this a different tour? Yeah, I mean I don't want to get too far off topic, but yeah, like Shaheen was, I was playing with him all the time and. Yeah, we went to England and the promoter, the guy who booked the tour, tried to keep us from leaving the country. He made us <laughs> dr drive like to Nottingham or something to give a random person like a hundred pounds because it's like, yeah, you owe us a hundred pounds. We're going to cancel your flights. It was insane. Well, that's the, that's guys, that's what, speaking of fragrant, that's what success smells like. And that's that's why even <laughs> even in our associated, you know, whether it's a side project or personal life, we just leave a trail of success everywhere we go. And I feel like you were being I mean, as I recall, I think I have a record where it's um in X models sort of post post punk phase when they were marketing themselves as a fundustrial yes, the fund industrial era. They, Somebody yeah. didn't you name that, Bobby? Might have, might have worked out that way. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody in Oneida named that them that. And I mean, it might have been that. It might have been them. But we were well, there. Well, we have the microphones and the recording platform, so I'm very comfortable saying we we came up with that. Yep. I remember that record was like X models featuring Kid Millions, like you were Buster Rhymes or something. It was like you were the featured artist. I felt like weird about that, <laughs> but I, I mean. <laughs> They they made the choice, so I'm like, all right, cool. Well, let's jump on to the next track then.
Yeah, so that's Brownout in Lagos. It is. Yeah. I'm going to tell you that um, Manish put a bet with Darius and Chris from Jag Jaguar that this would be your biggest album in the UK. He heard it and said, this is going to be the big record. And uh, I believe he is definitely owed something by Darius and Chris because rated O. They still haven't paid up. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's a behemoth of a record, isn't it? Even if it hadn't sold as many as other records, and I think it probably did, you could have gotten away with the biggest record victory because it is actually three LPs or three (laughs) CDs, depending on one's format preference. Um, It's also the centerpiece. So the album's rated O. It's the centerpiece of a project called Thank Your Parents, which began um, with preteen weaponry and ends with Absolute 2. So, you know, you have hours of music from all over the place. And that song, Brown on Lagos, is the first, that is the first track on the triple album <laughs> and uh it's rules <laughs> it's just so so fun and like okay so i mean i don't exactly remember everything related to this the electronic drum track we're like putting down percussion trying to make it work and my friend dada lee zi is we went to high school with and he was really into toasting like he he was doing this like i mean obsessively and so dodd ended up he was in new york and i was like man i just would love to get you over and like try to record something to this track we put together so dodd came out and dodd is such a fun wild really intelligent unique strong personality kind of guy but he didn't have a lot of experience recording. And so we're, it was me and Dodd and we're in the, in our studio, we have like five hours or something. And he's meticulously piecing together some kind of verse with different like overdubs and it goes on and on. And he keeps trying to hit the take and I'm sitting there listening. And I mean, anyone who's recorded can relate to this. You're listening and it's you're in pure terror. Nothing's working. And you're just like, this is not going to work. But you just have to remain calm and not like derail. And so he had finished his thing, you know, and it had been four hours or something. And it was not cool. It was fine, but it was not exciting. And it was very stiff. And I was like, hey, man, like when we just were testing the mic, like when we started, you like did you kind of were just freestyling and it was really exciting. Like, I don't know, can we just do a pass where you where you do something like that? And and Don goes, oh, yeah, sure. Like, that's always going to be better than trying to craft a verse. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, (laughs) Not even going to comment, just like, great, let's do it. And that's what you get. We sent it to the label kind of being like, we are going to blow your head off. This is the next Oneida song. And the just silence crickets, like nothing. No one believed it. That's so bizarre. This is Even like... though it was, that is Barry London playing the flute on that track, I'll have it's... you know. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a banger. Like it's a proper yeah. like dancehall banger. Yeah. I don't understand. It's sick, and it was yeah. so obvious. It was so obvious that it was going to be the first track on the record. Yeah. Right. Should we hear the next song? I'm in a cockfight. right on and then suddenly just like that 
the broken band is <laughs> reassembled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that song's Cockfight. Yep. Obviously. Named, named right at the top. That one is still regularly dropped in our live sets. Love to play that song. This is from the uh, 2018 album Romance. You bet. Uh, and what a song of romance yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was a period when we were actually doing a lot of playing together, but not a lot of recording. We had between what we last heard, right, Brownout and Lagos mm-hmm. and Cockfight, there's a long period of us working with abstract sound and abstract music on the album called A List of the Burning Mountains, which is all instrumental a very deep trip. That's the afterlife record for sure. Right. And then we did a series of uh, we did a series of cassettes um, that we self released along the way. Four cassettes that we then boxed up and sold as a box set called the Bra Tapes. Made an album with Reese Chatham. So we kind of went through all sorts of different things. And then Romance was to me a really exciting record and an exciting project. We pulled a couple of things from our recent past and then we had some songs that we were playing starting to play and we went and recorded them together in a studio and that one cockfight that's for the most part you're just hearing the live band play there's a coda tacked onto the end which was us kind of fucking around with a, a few ideas chaos of the universe ended up accidentally listening to it like spliced hard into the end and then we're like well we have to honor the the accident and <laughs> leave that in there. Synsonic drum and air organ and stuff. But pretty much that tune, I mean, there may be like an organ overdub and I think Jane did Jane did his vocal. We recorded that and then the rest of us went to dinner and we made Jane stay behind with no dinner <laughs> and record his vocal, as I recall. You know. And this came out on a new label. This came out on Joyful Noise Recordings. Yeah, on you new home. Yeah, it was important to us to stay based in Indiana we combed the corners of the state. <laughs> you rejected offers from both coasts, I take it. I don't think it ever occurred to us to look beyond Indiana. We never <laughs> wanted to leave the state. Well, so after List of the Burning Mountains, which was like a very abstract, awesome, awesome abstract rock album, Jag Jaguar said you know guys i mean i think we sent them romance yeah and they were like you know dudes it's been real but i think you guys should maybe be with you know find a new home so i just happened to think in these ways so i looked and pitched and i mean everybody i pitched everyone and I think we ended up in the best possible place. I'll also say, and this is reflective of Jag Jaguar as well as Joyful Noise. And, you know, obviously we're all sitting on this podcast for we've got history. But just in case people are wondering, it's been a a pleasure and, and a piece of luck for Oneida to work with honest straight shooter people in our entire career as a band in terms of the labels we've dealt with. There are certainly other, other contexts as a band. We've worked with people who are not trustworthy. Jai Jaguar and Joyful Noise, something you can say about the people who, you know, have run and staffed those labels is as a band, we experienced clear, honest communication. And I know that's not a very exciting thing to say on a podcast, but for people who are listening who wonder, like, that's hard to find. It's, it's really cool. They joke too. They're like, yeah, Oneida <laughs> built the label. Right. It's like, we, I don't know, dudes. It, I mean, but <laughs> they they were with us the whole way. They were supportive the whole way. Everything we wanted to do, they were like, until Let's 2018. Hear it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and they got they got a little tired of it. Yeah. But, but notice but to be but fair, notice, here we here we are, right? Like, yeah, yeah, are, yeah. Guess, exactly. That's a result of clear and honest communication. That, we're still I still years. talk to those guys. Yeah. And to be clear, Joyful Noise is very much part of the Secretly family. It yeah. It's distributed yeah. by Secretly globally. Yep. And there's a lot of the same people who have been working on the Joyful Noise records who also worked on all the Jag Jaguar records as well through yep. that distribution company. So yeah. there is that there is that through line. I like um, that. Con- yeah. Continuity is really cool. Yeah. And I, I believe Darius always used to say that there was like a through line of like 
Oneida with the big bound on Jack Jaguar and then Black Mountain opened for you on tour and then Black Mountain with the big bound on the label and Bon Iver opened for them on tour. So there was this through line. The lesson is never help anyone. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 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 we never thought to connect that, connect up with with uh, Bonnie Vare, Justin Vernon. Bring it full, bring it full circle. We we should have jumped on that right away. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm just joking. He it was really fun. I went to see them with Chris at Radio City. It was a really amazing show. It was so cool, and it was just fun. I mean, I think it was after. We stopped working together, I think, and it was like, hey, man, come to the show. It was it was amazing. So, Right. The next song. Yeah, we know that one. Hey, we still play that one. <laughs> that one is from the 2022 album Success. The song is I Want to Hold Your Electric Hand. Featured know. on the New York Times, the single pushed by one of their like oldest senior music writers, John Perellis, I think, which was like, mm-hmm. whoa, man, cool. <laughs> well, it is maybe one of the most uh poppiest in the broadest uh like spectrum of the word poppiest most accessible oneida songs and you know a long time into a career there what what made you think we want to just make a banger pop song at this point well we didn't i mean that was i mean i know that's (laughs) i mean i wish we i wish we had that sense but we truly i mean we've said this a bunch but we didn't try to make that album the way it was we weren't like trying to make it accessible and it just ended up that way but you know the the songs were there bobby wrote all of the demos i think part of that we don't talk a lot about influences because influences are usually pretty indirect for us but to be fair shortly before that song got put together i did play in a tribute to the modern lovers first record and learned all those songs and then came out of it. And I, I, I hear that. <laughs> I listen, I'm like, okay, yes, obviously it's just really that song. is just a reckless Eric song. And you guys all knew that, but I hear the modern lovers in it too. <laughs> they were yeah. a Boston band, right? Modern they were, lovers. They, yeah. they were Boston. And you've been playing like, a lot live recently, it feels like. Um, audiences have been really responding, especially to the new material, right? Yes. Yes and yes. We'll see what that feels like on a giant outdoor stage in uh, Queens in a couple days. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel that different. I mean, there definitely felt like there was a little bit of a, hey, wow, this Oneida album is is good. I saw a lot of comments where like these dudes are still, still going. Like I I saw them in 2002, like that's cool. Or I haven't heard from these guys in a long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think things are, things are going great. Success for us is sustainability and not meaning, you know, economic viability necessarily, or, but like continuing to feel like, oh, we keep making new music and loving it and people are responding to it. And we've never been a big popular band. Certainly our, the awareness of us has gone from very, very low to slightly less low, back to low, but never on like huge levels. But the fact that like we are still doing this, I mean, we are, we're most of the way through our next album. Like okay. we have a ton of new material. We're playing new songs. We have 
uh, an album's worth of stuff at least tracked now whether we use that or we do different takes or whatever it's still flowing and it's sort of startling in a positive way to feel like oh the the you know the hose is still on shit's still coming out (laughs) and we feel good about it and people feel good about it right it isn't just like we're shouting into a completely empty void which we probably will be at some point. Yes, yeah, still, still <laughs> fragrant. There you go. You got your pull quote. That's still your title. fragrant. That's the title of the next record, yeah, well, I think, isn't nailed it? Nailed it. <laughs> I, I, can we expect, I don't want you to reveal it, but can, after romance and success, these things come in threes, can we expect another emphatic one word title? I expect it, but yeah. that's yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have a title yet, Manish. Okay. I'll we'll throw that out there. I'm going to ask one last question for you. We've heard a lot of your songs from across the discography. What would be the song that you would choose as maybe if someone had never heard an Ida before, what would be that one song that you think maybe start there? I would say probably either Sheets of Easter or Each One Teach One. I mean, I maybe Bobby has a different one, but but those seem to be very core when somebody's like which what what album should i get i'm like well people really respond to you know each one teach one i have to step away and be like well this could be a way in so those would be my picks yeah i mean i think those are those are good picks they do seem like signature tunes we still play them more than 20 years later at the same time i would also want people to know like what we're doing now so you know, I would, I would, I think that beat me to the punch. The first song on the new album, the latest album on success, that kind of encapsulates a lot of where we are now. Nice pairing that with Sheets of Easter is a pretty good, pretty good summation of of, of the journey. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been a ton of fun, and we're really looking forward to hearing the next record. You've been listening to Secretly Frequencies. I'm Tom Davies, and my co-host is Manish Agarwal, and our guests this time were Bobby and Kid from Oneida. You can hear all the songs from today's episode on our playlists via the link in the show notes. And do check back in the Secretly Frequencies archive for shows with Kevin Morby, Numero Group, Dead Oceans, and more. Thanks for having me. The Secretly Society podcast is an original production of The Secretly Group. This episode was produced by Nadine Peters, edited by Sarah Miles, and exec produced by House of Hutch. The project manager for The Secretly Society podcast is Mimi Gontar. Robbie Morris is the creative director. Look out for more from The Secretly Society wherever you get your podcasts.